Hi, everyone. Um, we'll get started in a few minutes. We're just waiting for some more people to trickle in. Thanks for joining us today for Disaster Medicine, Equitable Healthcare in a Changing Climate, a panel co-sponsored by the Society of Fellows and Heyman Center for the Humanities and the Institute for Comparative Literature and Society. I'm Helen Zhao, this year's Graduate Fellow in Medical Humanities at the Society of Fellows Heyman Center. A quick reminder that the event is being recorded with the permission of our speakers. Um, and since this is a Zoom webinar, those in the audience won't appear in the recording except by way of any questions submitted. This event is part of an ongoing lecture series titled Explorations in Medical Humanities. Before we begin, let me just say a little bit about this series. The medical humanities offer a unique standpoint from which to study the influence of medico-scientific ideas and practices on society, whether by incorporating material culture, such as medical artifacts, performing symptomatic readings of poems and novels, or situating healthcare systems in a wider biosphere, the approaches that emerge from integrating different frameworks can supplement and enrich those coming strictly from the physician's black bag. Today, our speakers will explore how healthcare as we know it is likely to be impacted by climate change, 
From California's Dixie Fire to Hurricane Ida, the last year has proven once again that climate change is giving rise to more frequent and intense extreme weather events. Not only are these disasters fatal and costly, but they increase existing health disparities. The strain of disasters is unevenly distributed, more acutely affecting populations already underserved and in a state of ongoing emergency. At stake is the question of how to build and rebuild healthcare delivery systems to be both resilient as our climate changes and responsive to principles of justice. On that note, I'll turn it over to Dr. Chris Tedeschi, who will introduce our speakers. Dr. Tedeschi is Associate Professor of Emergency Medicine at Columbia University Medical Center and Director of Emergency Preparedness for the Department of Emergency Medicine at Columbia. His interests include wilderness and environmental medicine, as well as disaster preparedness and response. Dr. Tedeschi sits on the editorial board of the journal Wilderness and Environmental Medicine and is a fellow of the Academy of Wilderness Medicine. He has worked in disaster preparedness and response locally and internationally with an interest in media coverage and ethical, legal, and social issues during public health emergencies. He's course director for the medical student course in austere medicine at the Vagelos College of Physicians and Surgeons and track leader for the austere practice track at New York Presbyterian's Emergency Medicine Residency. He served as New York Presbyterian's team leader during the Hurricane Maria relief effort in Puerto Rico in 2017. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Tedeschi. Thank you so much, Helen, for that kind introduction. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here today with this group to talk about this critically important topic. Uh, I really appreciate the Institute for sponsoring the talk and inviting me to take part. Uh, today, we're joined by Dr. Robbie Parks from Columbia's Earth Institute, as well as Professor Joan Casey from the Department of Environmental Health Sciences. Our first presenter today will be Dr. Parks. As an environmental epidemiologist with a background in physics, Dr. Parks has diverse experience in large-scale, multidisciplinary, quantitative research. He's currently a postdoctoral research scientist at the Earth Institute. Robbie completed his PhD at the School of Public Health at Imperial College London in 2019 and graduated with a BA MA in physics from the University of Oxford. With that, uh, I'll turn it over to Dr. Parks and his presentation, Novel Assessments of the Health Impacts of Tropical Cyclones. Dr. Parks. Thank you very much. Um, I am just about to uh, share my screen. So let's see uh, if this works. Um, I'm optimistic. So, if that works, uh, without further ado, I'll I'll, uh, I'll continue. So, thank you very much for the introductions. Um, I'm going to uh, just elaborate upon a, a paper that you know. Uh, represents a lot of the work that I have been doing and am doing uh, over the past few years, but also over the next few years too, uh, focusing on sort of post-disaster, uh, particularly tropical cyclones and hurricanes uh, in the United States and, and the consequences for and the implications for public health and uh, in terms of hospitalizations, but also uh, other things in the near future. So uh, without further ado, uh, we'll continue to the talk. So just as an introduction, what are climate related exposures and how do they impact health? Well, I find the following overview from the Lancet countdown useful to frame the issue. Uh, so it's a complicated plot, but I just wanted to sort of frame the issue in terms of what uh, we're sort of thinking about or how maybe I think about uh, problems uh, with regards to climate change and, and, and sort of health impacts. So just as a sort of reminder. So first of all, greenhouse gas emissions and other pollutants result in air pollution and climate change, which affects certain climate related phenomena, such as uh, raised average temperatures, extreme weather, such as hurricanes and other cyclones, uh, particulate matter air pollution and others that you can see here. Uh, this in turn affects climate related exposures such as heat waves, fires and other societally uh, relevant phenomena, all of which impact health outcomes, which you could see in the bottom. 
uh, with many different mediating and uh, modifying factors such as uh, poverty and, and violence and, and other things there which aren't necessarily explicitly discussed, which should be. Uh, so I find this a useful, though uh, quite busy diagram with many missing and incomplete connections. So it's from a few years ago now, but um, you know, much progress has been made uh, since then, but still, you know, it's useful to understand uh, what uh, sort of framing of an issue such as climate change and health uh, with this diagram uh, may imply. So, uh, you know, so I'm going to focus on tropical cyclones uh, for this uh, particular talk. So I'm just going to go into that now. So first of all, what is a tropical cyclone? Uh, tropical cyclones, as you can see here, uh, such as hurricanes and tropical storms uh, are intense circular storms that originate over warm tropical oceans and are characterized by low atmospheric pressure and high wind speeds and, and rain and, and floods and other such things. And they draw uh, energy from the sea surface and maintain strength as long as they remain over warm water. So when they make landfall, they, they can be very destructive and disruptive. And you know, hurricanes, it seems more and more live in the memory of uh, many people in the United States. Uh, so, you know, they're very much uh, in, the, in the public conscious, uh, consciousness for, for large portions of, of the population. But what, what should we care about uh, in terms of public health and why should we care about them? Uh, well, they're very active in the United States. So with 30 uh, named storms, 2020 uh, was the most active uh, hurricane season on record uh, with 12 tropical storms and uh, six hurricanes. Uh, we went into Greek letters. And then 2021 was uh, the third also in all time records uh, with all the names, as you can see, they're uh, exhausted. So you know, they're not going anywhere. Uh, if anything, they are, there are hints they're getting stronger and, and, and busier. So they're going to remain a threat to the United States. Uh, the threat is also getting worse in some ways with the recent study showing trends of more tropical cyclones entering coastal regions over recent decades uh, with longer landfalls and peaks in strength closer to land. Uh, and tropical cyclones are extremely costly to the economy. Over the past century in the US, uh, nearly 200 hurricanes have resulted in about $2 trillion in uh, normalized damage, uh, but that's likely an underestimate. Uh, there's also some evidence of how serious their health consequences can be. Uh, so previous case studies have quantified their impact on some health outcomes. So I'm using an example of deaths in this figure with a range of causes attributed to hurricanes based on death certificate collection, which is very valuable, and there are other methods of doing that. But there's also a huge burden on hospitalizations. And uh, we know about big hurricanes like Sandy Katrina, but what about other smaller and less known ones? Um, and also tropical cyclones affect uh, many vulnerable parts of the world. And so, you know, while all research should take place in all these uh, vulnerable places, uh, starting off where there's a data rich supply of, of health information uh, is, 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 is not a bad start and uh, we're in the US so that's what I focus the study on. Uh, and so you know obviously resilience is a matter of environmental justice in this case because a lot while there's a collection of large high income enclaves on, on the uh, coasts in the United States. There's also disproportionately low income and historically disadvantaged communities there uh, more than other places too. So, um, so that brings me to the background of my uh, previous study, uh, which you can see here. So as a brief background to this paper, as a summary, hurricanes and other tropical cyclones have devastating impacts on society. And uh, previously to this, limited studies uh, hitherto have quantified their impacts on some health outcomes. Uh, and previous assessments uh, of health impacts have largely focused on single extreme events, including well-known examples such as uh, Katrina and, and Sandy and, 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 and many others. Uh, but there's a research gap that there was in comprehensively categorizing the impacts of cyclones on hospitalizations so what were the aims for this study? So our aims for this study were to 
characterize the impact of tropical cyclone exposure on hospitalizations from various causes in the US in an older population, and to identify effect modification by classification of tropical cyclone and type of hospitalization. So uh, first of all, a discussion on the data we used. So our study population was uh, Medicare enrollees with a total of 70 million hospitalizations during our study period of 1999 to 2014, or 16 years, in around 900 counties from 30 states, which experienced at least one tropical cyclone day during this period. And you can see total hospitalizations over time on the plot on, on the right, by colored by cause, which I'll get to in a second. And so we assessed health outcomes from hospitalizations using uh, IC9CM codes to create county level core specific hospitalization counts and divided these causes into 13 meaningful and exhaustive groups, including cardiovascular diseases, injuries, respiratory diseases, cancers, and uh, several others there. You can see along the bottom. So for our exposure uh, for tropical cyclones, uh, we classified uh, exposures as having winds greater than the Beaufort scale, uh, gale force wind speed. Uh, so, um, as you can see there, tropical cyclones is greater than 39 and 73 for hurricanes as well, which we did in the separate analysis. So, you can see on the map on the right, the total cyclone exposure which is the, the bluer it is, the more you know, exposures they had over, over the, in total during the time period. Uh, and, and you can see about, around two and a half thousand tropical cyclone exposure days in those included counties. And the range went from you know, around one day in, in our study period to, to 15 days in our study period. So some are getting bombarded a lot and some are, have experienced one cyclone uh, during this period, but they had to have a minimum of one exposure to be included in our analysis. Um, and uh, so uh, we further, you know, uh, did an, as I said, analyses in different ways. But uh, before that, I'll, I'll go into how the uh, brief details about the model and how, how that kind of operated so that uh, I can explain the results a little. So we analyzed the association between daily hospitalization rates and tropical cyclone exposure by applying a conditional quasi Poisson model. Uh, and so, you know, in brief, this approach examines contrasts within match strata, uh, similar to a case crossover study design, uh, but in a computationally efficient way. So in this case, we matched on county and Julian day of year. So that's one to three, six, five in the year is Julian day of year. So we only match on a particular day in another year in that particular county. And so we examined contrast within those uh, strata. So uh, if it's, uh, you know, cyclones typically wouldn't happen uh, on the 1st of February. So, but if it was the 1st of February in, in uh, New York City and there was a cyclone, we'd only compare with other 1st of February in other years in New York City. And you do that across all the exposed counties. And to quantify this association between hospitalization rates and cyclone exposure, we included uh, unconstrained lag terms, uh, you know, the take home message is that, that it's basically a, a term to analyze the, uh, the association with the incidence of a cyclone uh, from zero to seven uh, days after exposure. And we uh, adjusted for other such uh, important factors, uh, longer term time trends and mean temperature, the day of tropical cyclone. Uh, but the matching uh, process implicitly uh, accounts for uh, county level variation, uh, such as uh, socioeconomic status and other things, when you only compare the counties to themselves uh, across the, the states. So now that's the model covered, let's discuss a few results slides. Uh, oh, uh, yes, I also adjusted by day of the week, yeah, because even though it's 1st February and it's a Tuesday, last year's, I believe, was a Monday, so um, you know, different behaviours can, can be due to the day of the week it is in particular. And so we analysed the percentage change in hospitalisation rates associated with cyclone exposure, so to the right of zero is an increase, and to the left is a decrease, so we did this by days after tropical cyclone exposure up to seven days after the day of exposure. So on the y-axis, uh, the zero is the day of exposure, 
down so the day of the tropical cyclone down to seven days after the tropical cyclone exposure i'm going to highlight a few examples including respiratory diseases first of all so we observed the highest overall increases in hospitalization rates for respiratory diseases out of the 13 causes we studied and the increases occurred across all study days after the day of exposure so zero going down to seven everything's to the right of the dotted line uh for the most part and uh well the, the, all the all the central estimates are and, and the confidence intervals largely do clear for 95 percent of the dotted line uh peak but they peaked one day after exposure here with a 24 percent increase and uh you know one I, I won't have time to go into much of the sort of the uh let's say causal explanation behind these associations but it, i'll give it brief examples and one likely explanation for the elevated rates for respiratory hospitalizations uh, could be that you know those with respiratory issues may need power for medical equipment to breathe which compels them to visit a pa uh, hospital when power fails uh, where they currently uh, or normally reside so next uh, injuries injury hospitalization rates uh, increased across all study days after the day of exposure with peak two days after day of exposure around 13 and a half percent increase uh, than would be expected otherwise and so injury hospitalizations are impacted by cyclone exposure directly and indirectly during and immediately after tropical cyclone exposure common injuries uh, originate from transport accidents, structural collapse buildings, windborne debris, uh, flooding, falling trees and down power lines, for example. Days after exposure, injuries can also include puncture wounds, lacerations, uh, clear, uh, falling from clearing up roof uh, problems and, and burns and other such uh, things. And, and for cardiovascular diseases, as a, the third highlight, uh, we observed uh, decreased hospitalization rates on the day of exposure, uh, peaking two days after exposure, gradually returning to the rate expected during unexposed days within about a week. And so I'm about to show all of the causes of one uh, uh, plot. So there's going to be a lot. And you can see that I've, I talked about cardiovascular, respiratory and injuries. However, cardiovascular was kind of a, a sort of uh, exemplar of the pattern that we observed for many of the causes, which I highlighted in black, where you can see a decline at, on the day of uh, exposure to do with hospitalization rates, peaking one to three days later and gradually returning to the rate expected uh, during uh, unexposed days within about a week. I'll come back to this pattern a little bit later. So we've De dealt with broad causes so there's 13 broad causes here now they're important of course to uh dichotomize between them but there are also sub causes within those uh broad causes which we're going to have a look at uh, now so we also studied over 100 sub causes of hospitalization as subsets of the 13 mentioned broad causes uh, here i'm going to present the average change in hospitalization rates associated with the tropical cyclone exposure uh, again, with the right of zero an increase to the left a decrease. So in essence, this is instead of the particular days, this is the average effect over the week after tropical cyclone exposure for these. And consequently, on the y-axis this time, we've actually got sub-cause of hospitalization uh, grouped by main cause. So the colors will give you a clue to the grouping. Uh, I'm going to give an example to talk through here. There are over 100 subcauses, as I mentioned, so there was a lot there. Uh, cardiovascular diseases. So the subgroups of cardiovascular diseases. So while uh, cardiovascular diseases did not change overall and averaged over the week, so while there was a decrease and an increase, then back to expected level, uh, there was variation in changes to hospitalization rates for subcauses. Uh, so here you can see the subcauses for which hospitalization increased uh, with, uh, you know, increased in terms of the central estimate being to the right of the dotted line, though, of course, there is uncertainty. And so here you can see the sub causes uh, for which they increased and the highlight here being acute myocardial uh, infarction or heart attacks highlighted here. And in contrast, sub causes decreased with um, 
heart valve disorders uh, highlighted here. So, you know, these causes were largely divided up into emergency or acute increasing and uh, non-emergency or uh, chronic causes of hospitalization decreasing. And I'll briefly show the entire set of uh, sub-causes from the figure in uh, the paper now. So uh, that's the first half of it. So in the interest of time, I'm not going to look at everything, but uh, we did notice the broad dichotomy into emergency and acute increasing with non-emergency and chronic decreasing. And, and you could see the rest here, although I won't have time to go into them. They are uh, readily available via the, the, the sort of short link in the bottom left of the screen. So in addition, we examined the distinct impact of tropical cyclone exposures in which the county's peak sustained wind was uh, hurricane force uh, compared to uh, tropical cyclone class, but not quite hurricane. And so, um, Again, this is back to the first sort of figure where uh, on the x-axis, you're going to get the change uh, between, uh, sorry, I'll start again. You'll get the change with zero to the right of zero being an increase to the left of zero being a decrease again. And we're back to lag days after exposure on the y-axis. So it's zero to seven again. And here you can see for respiratory diseases, basically the, the, in terms of colors, the purple is a magnification of the orange. And so hurricanes uh, look like they have a larger um, amplified, more amplified association, uh, which is uh, exemplified by one day afterwards for respiratory diseases, for example. And of course the uncertainty is larger for the purple ones, a hurricane, because there are fewer of those events. But you know, it's, it's a clear uh, daylight between the impacts or the associations. But one uh, interesting thing which we thought was the fact that the orange or the non-hurricane tropical cyclone force winds still, uh, you know, they still were non-zero. So there still was an increase relative to what you'd expect without, um, which would imply maybe there are uh, associations that aren't necessarily grabbing the headlines, but are still there nonetheless. And just for good measure, there are all the causes um, and the broad causes. Uh, injuries, another decent example, uh, just on the top right below respiratory diseases. And so I just got a couple more slides to show. Uh, we examined the modifying effect of type of hospital admission. I said I'd come back to this earlier about why there was a decrease at the beginning and maybe an increase later. So we looked at emergency and non-emergency hospitalizations, so appointments and, you know, rush, rushing to the hospital. Uh, you can sort of think broadly of those kind of things. And this, the structure was the same as the previous diagram. So respiratory diseases, you can see that non-emergencies went down on average on the day of, and then they actually went up for uh, emergencies, uh, uh, hospitalizations on the day of. So there is a sort of uh, broad pattern of uh, the decreases being due to reductions in non-emergency and the increases being due to uh, increases in emergencies. And you can compare across uh, various highlights there and across the uh, particular broad causes. And so in summary, uh, cyclone exposure was uh, associated with overall increases in hospitalization for many causes and sub-causes, decreases for some non-emergency or chronic conditions, uh, hurricane force tropical cyclone exposure amplified the effect of weaker winds, uh, but there's still an impact of less strong tropical cyclone uh, exposure. Hospitalization rates increased driven by more emergency hospitalizations, but decreases driven by decrease in non-emergency. And so things to think about, acute versus chronic, which I sort of alluded to a lot, and what kind of associations, uh, if the effects are, are you know, uh, effect-driven, what they're driven by. And then just a few valuable insights. Um, but it's just a start, obviously. And so uh, watch this space for mortality of, uh, associations, chronic impacts, and other age groups, because we only did the Medicare population, because that was a complete record, but of 65 and over for our purposes. And so thanks to all the funding, and uh, thank you for listening. <laughs>
Fantastic. Thank you so much, Robbie. Um, I certainly have my long list of questions and comments, which I will save for after the next talk, but that was a fantastic introduction to, uh, I think, a lot of the really crucial issues that we're going to be talking about, that we're talking about today. Um, with that, I will move on, and it's a pleasure to introduce um, Professor Joan Casey, who will be discussing power outage preparedness, distribution, and duration spotlighting environmental justice. Dr. Casey is Assistant Professor of Environmental Health Sciences. She received her doctoral degree from the Department of Environmental Health Sciences at Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health in 2014. She is an environmental epidemiologist who focuses on environmental health, environmental justice, and sustainability. Her research uses electronic health records and spatial statistics to study the relationship between emerging environmental exposures and population health, she also considers vulnerable populations and the implications of health disparities, particularly in the era of climate change. Dr. Casey investigates a range of exposures, including unconventional natural gas and oil development, coal-fired power plants, wildfires, power outages, and concentrated animal feeding operations. She teaches in the MPH core at Columbia and holds a BS in biological and environmental engineering from Cornell University and a master's in applied physiology from the Teachers College at Columbia. With that, I'll turn it over to Dr. Casey. All right, thank you so much. Up there, all right. Uh, so super interesting talk from Robbie. Always great to see you speak, Robbie. And he mentioned as a bit of an aside, uh, power outages related to hurricanes. So maybe we're going to team up and, and do some work on that going forward. Um, but I will get, right into giving you kind of the lay of the land on where we are in our understanding of the relationship between power outages and health. Um, so I'll start off with some background, talk about how we lack a lot of data to do the studies we want to do, how we've generated some data and looked nationwide at it. And then I wanna talk a little bit about the 2021 uh, Texas power crisis that we probably all remember too well. <clears throat> Okay, so power outages. Let's take a second and think about the last power outage that you actually experienced, because almost all of us have experienced some sort of outage in our lives, right? So how long did it last? Seconds? Did the light flicker on and off? Minutes? Hours? What did this look like for you? This is the average duration of power outages worldwide. So you can understand here, Sub-Saharan Africa and Latin America and the Caribbean are leading with average durations of, hour outage, of outages approaching eight hours, which is very lengthy. Um, that number is quite a bit shorter, under four hours here in the United States. So was this outage annoying? Were you worried you weren't going to be able to look at Twitter because your phone was going to die? Or life-threatening? Were you concerned that your medical equipment that you had to plug in at home wasn't going to run and you were going to run out of backup battery power? So there's this huge spectrum of the implications of power outages for health. Did your home get too hot? So this was an interesting paper where um, Stone and colleagues actually simulated indoor temperatures in three major cities in the United States during uh, heat waves that actually occurred between 1980 and um, 2009. And so on the top panel, they're estimating indoor temperatures, um, assuming the power is on. So air conditioners are running, fans are running, um, dehumidifiers are running. What does this look like? And so you can see um, dark brown is extreme danger. So that's heat stroke lightly all the way down to this kind of periwinkle color, which is low risk of any sort of um, heat related exposure risk. So you can see on the top panel, things are looking pretty good. On the bottom panel, they're estimating indoor temperatures when there's been a power outage lasting five days. And they're estimating on the fifth day, this is the temperature that would be reached in most homes in these cities. So Atlanta, Detroit, and Phoenix. So you can see in a power outage scenario, things look much, much worse. Um, almost every home, in this snapshot of Phoenix is in the danger zone of heat exhaustion likely and heat stroke possible. So things rapidly can get much worse when we lose power 
was your home too cold during this power outage that you experienced? So the 2021 Texas outage occurred during this severe winter storm that swept the state. Uh, it caused electricity demand to skyrocket. It also caused natural gas and other generating sources to fail. And because the Texas grid is essentially cut off from the rest of the country, uh, no electricity was able to be brought in from other states. So this is a schematic, again, like the one Robbie presented, somewhat complicated, um, that links what we think about power outage to health. And so here on the far left, some of the issues we're going to be facing, obviously climate change, is going to increase the frequency of these natural disasters. We also have an aging electric grid, as well as increased electricity demand as we try to um, go fossil fuel free in our economies. Um, and so these can be linked to power outages. Uh, importantly, to consider vulnerability factors related to power outage, things that can make it much more difficult to respond or that will worsen health status. So things like being very young or very old, uh, being of lower socioeconomic status, certain occupational exposures are really problematic. Um, and then these things can lead to both incident disease. So carbon monoxide poisoning has been the thing most documented during power outages when people inappropriately run generators inside and end up poisoning themselves. Um, but there've been some, some evidence from other single outage studies seeing increases in gastrointestinal illness, heart attack, injury, mental health problems, renal disease, and temperature related illness. There's also the possibility to exacerbate pre-existing diseases like asthma and COPD. Uh, for example, if you're using an oxygen pump at home and you lose power, that could be extremely problematic. Uh, and then there can be links to mortality as well. So we know we should be concerned about power outages, but where is the data at to study them? Um, the US Energy Information Administration collects pretty decent data at the state level on this. And so what we can see from 2013 to 2020 is kind of this upward trend in the average duration of total outages in the US. Um, they break it down into with major events and without major events. Major events are things like snowstorms, wildfires, hurricanes, so climate events that are leading to outages. And so it looks like those may also be increasing over time as we anticipate. And they also break this down at the state level. And so here they're plotting on the y-axis, the number of major interruptions that states are experiencing. And on the x-axis, the total duration of those interruptions um, summed up over the year. And so you can see uh, Louisiana hanging out here is doing the worst, where on average, the total duration of outages in Louisiana was 60 hours, and they had about three total. Um, the U.S. average is down here. So you can start to see some of the outliers. But, but really, in order to target public health intervention, to prepare healthcare systems, to have appropriate infrastructure improvements, we really need sub-state level data to do that. And when our team went out and started looking for these data, we could not find them. So we set out to try to create them. So to do this, we used something called poweroutage.us data. So this is the company that essentially pulls real-time data from utility APIs to track customers without power for the entire uh, United States. And so we um, were able to get from them the total number of customers served in each county, uh, customers meaning both households and non-residential units like a bagel shop would be counted as a customer. Um, and we were able to get this information at the sub-hourly county level from 2018 to 2020. Um, and so let me show you a little bit more what this looks like. This is work that was led primarily by Vivian Doe, who's a PhD student here in environmental health sciences, and Heather McBrien, who is a research assistant in our department as well. And so basically what we received from poweroutage.us were these enormous spreadsheets where rows um, were a report every time the number of customers out from a utility in a county uh, changed the number of customers without power. And so we had this extremely large data set that we summarized to the hourly level. So for every county, in the country over this time period, during every hour, 
we could identify the number of customers out. So in the end, the multiplication of all of this led to about 79 million rows of data on power outages for the United States during this time period. So we use this data to take a nationwide perspective. So the bulk of what I want to tell you about now is what we learned. What do we know now that we didn't know before? So to summarize county level power outages, we wanted to look at it in two different ways. First, we wanted to look at um, a relative metric of power outages. And so here we identified a county as undergoing a power outage when more than 0.5% of the people living in that county were without power for either an hour plus duration or eight hour plus duration. Um, we conceptualize this eight hour plus as kind of a medically relevant power outage. Uh, this would be a long time to go without air conditioning or without heat or uh, without charging a medical device. And so we were interested in both of these. We thought it was important to use this relative metric because the population size of US counties differs a lot. So we didn't wanna just count up the total number of people without power because then we would just identify urban, highly populated counties. So here we're able to compare both rural and urban counties. Then we created this absolute metric, which is just summing up the total number of customers without power over time. And so we had both of these metrics for analysis. We were then also really interested in metrics of vulnerability. So you saw a little bit of this on the schematic earlier. So the first thing we were interested in was characterizing people who used electricity dependent dur durable medical equipment devices. Um, and we did this using the full Medicare population. And so for every county in the US, we had the prevalence of people relying on these devices. Um, and so that's important because the, we think of this group as being the highest at risk during a power outage because they usually have an underlying medical condition that's requiring the use of DME. Uh, and so you can see uh, mapped here, the dark blue are the least at risk, the lower prevalence of DME use, and the red is the highest use. We also mapped the Centers for Disease Control Prevention's Social Vulnerability Index. So SVI incorporates 15 different variables with facets of things like socioeconomic status, housing quality, transportation, disability, and race ethnicity to generate this index of vulnerability. Um, the CDC states the goal of this index to help public health officials and emergency response planners identify and map the communities that will most likely need support before, during, and after a hazardous event. So we selected this index because it mapped so well on to our exposure of interest. And so here again, the dark blue are lower vulnerability levels and red are the highest vulnerability counties. Okay, so let me show you what we found for power outages. Our study included 99% of all US counties. Um, a few counties didn't have uh, electricity providers with APIs. And so that data wasn't picked up by poweroutage.us. So in our sample over this three year study period, we had 92% of counties had at least one eight hour outage um, and 99% had at least a one hour outage. There were nearly 25,000 eight hour outages. Uh, and you can see kind of the breakdown here. So the median uh, was two eight hour outages um, each year during the study period. Here's the distribution of those eight hour outages. So the darker colors are uh, higher outage frequencies. So you can see uh, Louisiana, part of Texas, uh, through Appalachia, Michigan, parts of the Northeast and Maine and Northern California are really the places that had the most eight hour outage events. Um, and these are the one hour outages, somewhat of a similar pattern, but you can, you can obviously see some differences. You can also see the numbers of one hour outages are much higher. So some places having over 75, at least one hour outage events annually, annual average. So not summed over the years. And then these are total uh, customer hours out. So from one hour up to, I don't know, 127 million hours out. So a huge range here. And this maps somewhat on to population density, but obviously not completely. Maine has a very low population density, but you can still still has a large number of customer hours out here. Okay, so then we wanted to look at the pattern 
uh, across the year and across the day for when power outages were actually starting. So are there times that we're more at risk of experiencing power outages? I think we probably know, yes, in fact, there are those times, right? Um, your utility might actually pay, allow you to uh, pay less money for electricity use during those off-peak hours. So they do that because the demand is lower. Um, so we see here on the y-axis, this is uh, military time, so from um, midnight to midnight, and then we're looking across the year. And so you can see we have a concentration of outages, no surprise, kind of during the summer months. And in fact, they are starting um, during those peak hours, the more outages are starting, right, between kind of 3 to 8 p.m. at night. When people get home, they turn on their AC, they turn on the lights, they turn on heat, depending. So um, this, is, this isn't shocking, but the first time we've kind of seen this for the whole country. We then wanted to see how this mapped on to uh, those vulnerability metrics that I was interested in. And so what does this look like by quartiles of durable medical equipment use? So we can see the highest quartile of use, the counties where more people are using electricity dependent medical equipment. We actually see um, higher counts of outages, which you can see by more orange and red here. Um, but so the patterns kind of remain the same across. Um, we also used something called a bivariate local indicators of association or ELISA to identify counties that had both really high prevalence of durable medical equipment use and also a high prevalence of power outages. So these are places we might want to target resources. Um, and you can see the clusters of high DME use and high power outage counts in red. Um, so Appalachia, parts of Michigan, Louisiana, West Texas, and parts of Northern California. <laughs> Now this is looking at eight hour outages by another metric of vulnerability. Um, here you can see again, the highest vulnerability counties appear to have more outages. Uh, similarly, so for the third and fourth quartile, which these are the highest levels of vulnerability. And again, we map that using the same LISA. We see kind of actually the similar clusters jump out. So perhaps these are places we need to start thinking about targeting resources. Okay, I just want to very briefly touch on the Texas power crisis. And so this is work led by Nina Flores, who's a PhD student in our department here of environmental health. Um, and so this is a map that Nina generated. And so this is obviously a much more severe event. It lasted from February 10th to 24th. And here we're showing shading of counties where over 10,000 people were without power for different periods of time. So places in this kind of royal blue are counties where people were without power for at least two days. Um, so, you know, quite a severe event. And we can look at that over time. So this is, you know, from that February 10th to February 20th over time. And then on the y-axis, we're looking at number of people without power. And so you can see some counties really drove this. So purple, this dark purple, um, Harris County, which is where Houston is located. Um, and then these other two purples are in the Dallas metro area. So really large numbers of people, just those three counties combined, there was over a million people without power uh, at some point during this outage event. So this event goes, goes up to affecting at least 4 million people at its peak. So we did several things related to this outage. I'm not gonna get into them all today, but one thing I briefly wanna run through is we actually conducted a Qualtrics survey in Texas a couple months after this event to ask people about power outage experience uh, as well as power outage preparedness because we are interested in uh, both of those things and also disparities in exposure duration and preparedness. And so, very briefly to give you results of that. We surveyed about a thousand people, 53% of them reported experiencing a 24 hour or longer outage in the prior year. Uh, black respondents had 1.7 times the odds of reporting an outage experience of 24 hours or greater compared to white respondents. We saw that people living in households uh, that relied on this electricity dependent medical equipment weren't any more prepared unfortunately, than those that did not. Uh, and finally, we saw that lower educational attainment was associated with reduced odds preparedness. We've seen that uh, 
in in other types of preparedness work, but I'm not sure if we've seen it specifically related to power outages. So to summarize, we now need more research on the health implications of outages. To date, we've really just seen primarily um, healthcare utilization at one or two hospitals after a single outage event, usually from a very large storm. But what about these repeated outages uh, in many counties, in many places over time? It also, of course, would be useful to have sub-county information because even at the, at the county level, which is the best we have to date, we still can have a lot of variability of what's happening within a county. Um, and so thinking about these vulnerability metrics, we need to consider environmental justice to equitably allocate our preparedness resources, our disaster response, and our infrastructure improvements. So I will end there and just say thank you to Crisis Ready and NIEHS for helping to fund this work. Thank you. Thank you so much, Joan. I think that that was a perfect compliment to the talk that Robbie gave a little bit earlier um, and, and fascinating in a lot of ways. I'll, I'll offer a few moments of sort of <laughs> extemporaneous comments or questions and then um, turn it over to the group. And we, we have one or two questions already in the Q&A. Uh, I think, you know, listening to both of these talks, Helen mentioned earlier that I had been part of our uh, hospitals group that responded in Puerto Rico after Hurricane Maria a couple of years ago. And listening to both of you talk just reminded me of a single afternoon down there around two or three weeks after the storm. Uh, I was part of a group that traveled to a nursing home in a, in a sort of rural area. And that nursing home had been obviously without power for a couple of weeks and had concentrated all of their uh, you know, vulnerable older population into a single big room where they had a small generator running an air conditioner. And our job was to sort of sort through that population and, and, and figure out who was sick enough to be transported to some of the hospitals we were running. And it, and it was hot and it was stressful. And later that day, I went back to San Juan with a group to the sort of headquarters there and had a cold beer in an air conditioned restaurant uh, next to a casino where people were playing blackjack and craps. Um, you know, and it was two hours later. And I think that that uh, unbelievable distinction is something that I'll remember for a long time and kind of highlights a lot of, a lot of these points. It's, it's really um, gratifying to see over the last few years, sort of an explosion of quantitative data that look at some of the effects of, of climate related events, whether it's heat or hurricanes. Um, and I think that we'll be able to start using that data in a proactive way uh, as, as we move on. But just even over the last several years, the, the granular level of data that we're seeing uh, sort of exemplified by these two studies has, has been an enormous boon to people that are thinking about policy and, uh, and health equity for that for that matter. Uh, I, I would love as Robbie continues his work to see uh, sort of a, an additional level of granularity almost in terms of um, some of the socioeconomic determinants within the populations that you look at, whether it's, um, you know, in the terms of co in terms of coastal storms, whether it's whether it's housing security or uh, elevation above sea level, uh, I think that one thing that we haven't really talked about that's worth uh, thinking about more is not just power, but broadband internet. And from a medical point of view, access to broadband becomes uh, pretty critical. And, and one of those things that may lead to um, different outcomes. I, I think that, um, you know, Joan showed the slide of kind of correlating the, the degree of vulnerability with the length of outages and kind of leading to those few sort of hotspots that popped up. And, and that sort of um, visualization of data to me is great to see and also a roadmap for, for very um, specific you know, interventions, whether they be policy interventions or medical interventions. And, and I hope we get to see a lot more of that as we start to talk about climate uh, related disasters in particular. Um, 
you know, again, I, I think about telemedicine and broadband internet a lot. And what we've learned over the last few years, at least in the US, in terms of uh, coastal storm response and availability to power is that broadband availability not only is really inconsistent across the US, but becoming a much larger part of our disaster response um, as relates to telemedicine. And we certainly kind of normalized that with COVID, I think. But even if you look at uh, the sort of serial hurricanes back in 2017, the, the number of folks that were accessing telemedical care, which obviously requires not just power, but internet access and a lot of other uh, savvy um, is, is not only uh, crucial, but very kind of inequitable or in, in not homogeneously distributed. Um, even in the COVID context, some of our colleagues at Cornell, you know, in the, in the setting of the COVID search, looked at the um, zip codes where our telemedicine visits arose from at, at New York Presbyterian and um, looked at the COVID incidents in those zip codes. And it, you know, it's almost inversely proportional. So the, so the areas with the least amount of COVID incidents were making the most telemedicine visits. And I, I think that that uh, is, is telling and probably relates to a lot of the issues that, that you folks just talked about and that I think are important to think about uh, as we kind of move on. The only thing, the other thing that struck me uh, from some of Robbie's data, and, and it partially has to do with the telemedicine thing, but just in general, the, uh, the, the particular breakdown of neuropsychiatric disease there, which you didn't, uh, you know, there are so many different components to think of, but I think it's worth considering the access to, you know, mental health care and behavioral health care in a lot of the populations that we're talking about and how some of the systems that were, you know, ideally trying to reimagine in the wake of disasters um, may address behavioral health or mental health questions. It's a little bit different than uh, whether or not you can charge your oxygen concentrator, but I think that the availability to access to care may be something that is would be really interesting to quantify, um, and certainly a, a gaping, you know, in some ways a gaping uh, hole in our in our public health system, and certainly in our disaster response system. Robbie, I'd love you to look at children next time around, um, because the you know the pediatric population uh, is probably one of the most you know, vulnerable populations um, in settings like this. And frankly, something we don't prepare for a lot. Uh, those of us that don't spend you know, our entire time taking care of kids often uh, make the mistake of not, not thinking about kids in these contexts and it's, it's critically important. So I'd be really curious about the sort of pediatric side of things. You also briefly touched on mortality rates. And I, I think that that was a little bit of a teaser maybe in that, uh, you know, justifying or quantifying, uh, I hope there's something more coming, you know, quantifying mortality rates in, in these settings is so terribly difficult. You mentioned death certificates, which in the US can be helpful. In Puerto Rico, it was, uh, as you all know, a, a enormous uh, area of controversy and something that is probably still unresolved to some degree because the death certificates were, were not a great way to, to quantify um, mortality, although it turns out to be critically important, again, as we try to make policy, um, even, you know, in, in environmental exposure, even figuring out uh, sort of proximate causes can be super difficult on a, on, from the medical point of view. Um, there was a story in the news a few I don't know, a few months ago now about a family that died hiking in California and it was ultimately decided that they had been victims of extreme heat. Uh, I, I got a call from a magazine editor after that story uh, when the medical examiner had made that determination uh, sort of on background and their question was, well, how can they tell they died from heat? And you know, there's no uh, easy medical examiner uh, question in, in a broad scale that, you can even determine that this one family, uh, you know, how, how, how do you know? How do you know it was heat illness? How do you know they died of heat stroke? Uh, turns out to be not a terribly simple medical question to answer. And as we extrapolate that to enormous populations, it obviously becomes um, not just a medical issue, but a policy issue and sometimes even a political issue. So I appreciate you touching on those things. Um, 
And I think that there's probably lots of fodder for, for work in the future. And then I, I guess my only, my last thought would be to encourage all of us to um, continue to look at the recovery phase of, of disaster, you know, this sort of disaster cycle that we go through. It's, it's um, very difficult to, to define recovery, let alone quantify recovery. And I think that looking at the way we recover from some of these events, um, whether it's you know, getting back to that point that we would have been if this never happened versus um, rebuilding and, and measuring uh, you know, whether individual or community recovery is something we don't probably don't talk about as much as we should. And probably that's because it's really hard to quantify. So I, I'd appreciate anybody's thoughts on kind of how, how we measure recovery as we sort of move on. Um, with that, I will try to open it up to a Q&A. I don't know if, if Robbie or John have any particular comments uh, you know, in response to those few points we just brought up. I'm looking at a few questions in the Q&A. Uh, so maybe uh, unless either of you have something to add, I will take a look at some of these and we'll, we'll begin to open the discussion a bit. I was just going to say that to your last point, you mentioned a lot of great points. Um, so a lot, a lot of ground covered. But that last point about recovery, I think, is a really interesting one because something we see a lot in uh, epidemiology is that kind of the first storm of the season or the first heat wave of the season is often worse um, because maybe people aren't prepared or they haven't, they're not thinking about it, or it's 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 truly unexpected if you have a heat wave in April versus there's a heat wave in, heat wave in August. And so I also think like that component of this as well will be really interesting to understand. But I agree thinking about hopefully there are some lessons learned and some like reallocation of resources when an event has taken place is one of the things. And also then, you know, we do know that we can strengthen through these experiences together. And, you know, if, if community builds around one another or um, resources are reallocated within a community, things could improve. So I think, yeah, these are all really key things to think about as we're trying to allocate limited resources, think about the smartest steps to take when we have little time. Absolutely. Robbie, do you uh, have anything to say about mortality? Because I can't resist asking you. Uh, so first of all, yeah, I agree with Joan and, and the contents of her awesome talk and, and what she just said about what your feedback was. I think uh, I've re I was writing stuff down as you were talking because I thought it was so, <laughs> so, uh, so insightful to hear from, from your perspective. Yeah, so, so uh, yeah, what's this space for mortality? I have been conducting a study that's in press, uh, looking at sort of the, the, a few, the months after uh, cyclones and hurricanes and what happens to, but uh, by broad causes of death uh, in the United States. So um, I, I think that should be out in the next uh, few weeks, I think, but, um, I didn't show it today because I, I thought that there was a lot of other detail to cover. And you're right, it did focus on Medicare. And, and one of the things I wrote down and highlighted was that, you know, other age groups, particularly children, and I'm trying to think of ways in which we, we sort of tackle that issue because of, like you, you're, you're, you're dead right. I mean, children are often not necessarily the focus of these kind of studies. And I think a lot of information there would, in particular to sort of long-term implications for not just physical, but also their mental health and, and their educational attainment. And so Joan uh, highlighted that a little bit at the end of her talk, but we're sort of thinking about how med uh, educational attainment might be measured by, in relation to sort of long-term impacts of uh, disasters as well, not just cyclones and hurricanes, but other things. So, so yeah, so just th th there is some stuff coming and for, for me and, uh, maybe a lot more over the next few years because I, I will be focusing a lot on cyclones, so. We, we will stay tuned for sure. Um, you, you, you know, the other thing that was super interesting, I think in your data was the um, decrease in admissions for chronic illness. And I, I don't think that should be overlooked. I, it's something we've certainly experienced, you know, again, in, in the COVID setting uh, and what goes around comes around to some degree. And unfortunately, I think we're seeing a lot worse outcomes because of that. But I think that's a fascinating um, sort of finding to highlight that that 
care for chronic disease in general in these settings becomes um, almost a luxury in some populations. And there are certainly uh, a lot of downstream uh, effects of that. Uh, just taking a look at some of the comments that are coming up in the, in the, uh, in the chat and in the Q&A section, um, th there's a question about uh, Robbie, that a, a takeaway from one of the takeaways from your talk is that as these disasters increase in frequency, it sounds like a lot of uh, healthcare delivery for chronic conditions or non emergency conditions might move away from the inpatient or the hospital or the acute setting. Um, but moving healthcare delivery into the home kind of puts people at the mercy of a consistent power supply. This is an infrastructure question in a sense, and, and is there anything to say about whether in the long run, uh, you know, disasters like these may uh, cause some sort of decentralization of care delivery or um, otherwise reshape the way we deliver care? And, and there, there may be others in the audience that can equally address that question. I don't know if we can do that, but do, 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 does that make sense? Uh, yeah, I, I think um, it's a, a great question in many ways, but because it sort of highlights the sort of nexus that perhaps Joe and I are operating on with power outages and and, and uh, sort of health impacts. Um, and and yeah, of course, uh, telemedicine, as you mentioned, as but also sort of smaller um, contexts away from just ho large hospitals may be uh, important areas of of care, and, and I'm, I'm not really um, sort of qualified to talk about that. But as well, one thing I would imagine is true is that there are limits to sort of telemedicine in as much as, you know, if you, if you are requiring an elective uh, operation, obviously telemedicine it can only go so far. So, yeah, I would call it a sort of ticking time bomb of, of health. Just because the admissions are going down, it doesn't mean that everyone's fine. In fact, it could mean that people have the opposite of fine and they may in fact have died already. And that's why the hospitalization has gone down. So it's be hard to pick apart. And so I think that question is fantastic. And yeah, it's exciting me to, to explore that in, much, uh, a deep, in a much deeper way, particularly with power outages. Yeah, I think that's that's sort of what we saw in Puerto Rico. Most of the folks that, you know, lots of people never made it to the hospital in Puerto Rico. And in some ways that data is 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 disappeared, unfortunately. Um, Joan, you you in a very offhand way mentioned the disconnection of the Texas power grid uh, from from the rest of from the rest of, of everyone. And, you know, it kind of begs the question based on some of the data that you're collecting, um, what, what ways to mitigate risk are suggested here? What strategies either have you seen that are successful in kind of dousing those hotspots on those maps or what strategies uh, you know, both, I think both of you mentioned resilience, at least in passing. What, what strategies are suggested by some of the data that you're discovering or conclusions that you're drawing? So I think like the, the smart grid is probably a big one so that we can, a big problem in Texas was there was this huge surge in demand coupled with everything breaking down. And so if, they had been able, I didn't, I don't think I showed this slide, but we also asked people how they were told a power outage was going to occur. And 60% of people said they had no idea a power outage was going to occur. So, communi so communication, being able to reallocate kind of the electricity flow, slow things without entirely shutting off the faucet, um, providing people more information about uh, changes in pricing. I didn't get into the thousands and thousands of dollars that some people were asked to pay for the electricity they used during that crisis when the prices shot up exponentially. Um, so, so those sorts of technological innovations, um, obviously another big one is going to be more distributed power generation, right? So if we have solar and storage in Washington Heights, uh, we're not relying on the, the grid of all of New York City to supply our power. So it doesn't matter nearly as much if power is cut off somewhere else. Um, 
the entire Texas grid doesn't go down if my small town is relying on wind, for example, and storage in our community. Uh, so that's that's another direction to go. We also obviously need massive infrastructure updates, uh, which hopefully we will start funding, which um, we can create a lot of jobs to do and also save a lot of lives likely. So uh, those are some of the things going forward. But honestly, we don't have great, we definitely don't have great data from a health perspective on that question. Um, we know from electrical engineering and, and other places kind of about what predicts power outage severity, but we, we don't, we know fairly little. Um, and I was also just going to mention based on the conversation about people not showing up for care. Uh, we have another study out in California looking at the Woolsey fire, one of the largest fires ever in the state of California. And we're looking specifically at people that rely on electricity dependent medical equipment. Um, so we have hundreds of thousands of people that rely on that. And we're looking at their healthcare utilization during and after that fire. And we see this exact thing that you all are talking about. So we see a huge drop in outpatient visits, but we see an increase in hospitalizations in this group. So they're not getting kind of their chronic, you know, baseline care, but they're showing up in crisis. Um, and so I think we're going to see this story show up more and more. And so, yeah, I would be, actually would be really curious to hear you talk a little bit more about broadband and why you think it's so critical because it's not as intuitive to me how that solves uh, solves problems. So I'd, I'd love just to hear a little bit more about that. You know, I think uh, someone mentioned the decentralization of the system a little bit. And I think that uh, one thing we've learned from COVID certainly is that the potential of telemedical care um, is, is larger than many people thought. There, there's a question in the chat about, or in the, in the Q&A about uh, price differential. And it turns out to be, you know, pretty complicated in that, um, you, you know, without getting into the issues of insurance reimbursements and medical licensing and that sort of thing. But you can certainly imagine a system in which um, people who require either, you know, mental health care or, um, urgent care type medical care in the wake of a disaster when medical facilities are overwhelmed with more acute patients can take advantage of that. Uh, it's a way to decentralize the care. It's also, uh, you know, in the right setting, a way to decentralize the human resources, you know, workflow. So if, if you're in Louisiana after a storm and you have internet access, you may be able to, you may be able to connect to a provider in New York uh, who is either a uh, you know, part of a for-profit telemedicine system or some kind of teleresponder who has volunteered to, to help out with this sort of thing. Uh, it's rife with um, not only technical concerns, but probably ethical ones too. You know, both uh, in Florida and Texas after Maria, we saw uh, some of the big uh, urgent care type telemedical you know, there's, there's, there's companies that do this as, as their business. And there was a point where they were offering free visits uh, to anyone who connected, which sounds wonderful, um, you know, but there was a free one visit maximum. And so you can certainly imagine someone connecting to care, getting a free visit, and then not being able to afford a follow-up visit or not having a follow-up visit, uh, which, becomes, which becomes a little bit problematic. Um, the... Uh, official response mechanism that we have in the US at least, you know, from the Department of Health and Human Services is nowhere near being able to create some kind of network um, to facilitate this. But there, there is some potential with it. You know, in, in Puerto Rico, uh, we made use of our own facilities in that we were able to connect by satellite to specialists. So um, we had, for instance, you know, young children with poorly controlled diabetes after Maria that None of us are certainly our pediatric uh, diabetes specialists, but we were able to connect in real time with some of those specialists back in New York and, and provide uh, sort of appropriate care or at least get at least phone a friend, so to speak. So that that sort of consultant um, model may certainly help. And it, and it gets around a lot of the complicated licensing regulations that that we have in telemedicine, because you can only practice um, you have to be licensed in the area, in, in the place where your patient is. Uh, 
So if I'm not licensed in Louisiana, I can't see a patient in Louisiana if I'm, in, you know, even though I'm licensed in New York and that's where I am. So it's, it's, it's to be continued in, in some ways and, and it's certainly worth thinking about. Yeah, that's super interesting. I just wanted to add, because this got me thinking, so not just about our response, but also about prevention and kind of these technologies that we can leverage. Because I remember reading a paper about a pharmacy. It was a, it was actually a randomized trial, I think, of a pharmacy sending out reminders to patients, I think, to fill insulin uh, orders prior to a large hurricane or some event that was coming in. And they saw that these people did better because more people came in and refilled because they wouldn't be able to do it later. And so even slight changes like that, that we can leverage the technology that we have can could potentially be helpful when we get better at predicting uh, these events occurring. That's fascinating. How simple, right? It's as simple as a text message. Yeah, um, I know. It, a JAMA study on something so simple. But yeah, I thought it was kind of brilliant. Uh, just taking a look at the Q&A, there's one. Uh, Robbie, someone is asking if you are able to provide a link to a preliminary draft for your upcoming study, or at least um, where and when we may see it, uh, even if you, uh, I don't know if you're posting the, doing P, P, pre peer review posting out there, but um, if there's a way for us to keep our eyes open to, to know when it comes out, that would be great. Or just give us a heads up. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I fully support the, the whole preprint system and, and how that helps to sort of open up uh, research before it's published for analysis. But this one isn't on preprint and um, it will be out in the next few weeks. I, I just received an email that it will be it will be out in the next few weeks and it's embargoed. So that, that's the only reason I'm not going to talk about it too much. But uh, if you care to follow me on Twitter, or I, I'm very happy to share it. I, I'll be posting it there. I, I'm very happy to share it uh, with uh, anyone associated with this talk uh, once it comes out. Super. So, Sorry um, to be so I'm not normally so mysterious in my research. That's, I know that's very that's very <laughs> of you. Uh, under understood. Uh, we're yeah, looking forward. Yeah, um, another question that just came to me in the chat uh, for any of us, I guess. You know, are, and this is a this is actually a great question. You know, how can we ensure that research on health impacts of climate change is is heard by the right stakeholders? Um, there is a there is an echo chamber effect here. I think a little bit of a little bit of time and our environmental health sciences part uh, our environmental health sciences part of the medical student curriculum. Given the urgency of these issues, I'm wondering if we could discuss the way to translate research findings into action. Um, I'll leave that to you guys. I can tell you that the medical school curriculum uh, is is pretty light on public health, although we certainly um, you know in, in some ways in the courses that I teach try to engage. Uh, climate and health in a way that hasn't been uh, approached at the med school yet. Um, you know, the establishment of the climate school has helped this a lot. I think that Mailman has probably seen a lot more penetrance into the curriculum of some climate and health issues. Um, if anyone wants to come talk to a bunch of med students this spring, you are consider it an open invitation. Um, but it's a great question. How do how do we make sure the right people read this research and understand the policy implications of it? Great. Besides Twitter, or is Twitter the answer? There seem to be a lot of MDs on Twitter. Are, are MDs the main outlet? I don't know. Yeah, it seems like everyone needs to be talking about this. I think we're moving in this direction. People are now, you know, the younger generation understands that this is the most pressing issue of our time. Nothing else is going to function if we don't deal with climate change. I mean, we're in we're in it now. And so, uh, yeah, we do need to keep working. And I mean, it, it's things like Twitter, it's talking to reporters, um, it's making things accessible. But I agree, the more, you know, like the Robert Wood Johnson, uh, uh, what are clinical scholars that were about kind of social determinants of health and medicine, maybe we need a climate version of Robert Wood Johnson climate scholars. Uh, that's kind of like a prestigious thing where there are then leaders seated throughout, cause it's, you know, throughout med, throughout the country. Um, and we need other people on board, right? We need, we need like our nursing assistants to understand that this is an issue. We, we need everyone to be involved. And so, yeah, it's, it's figuring out how to do that. I don't have the answer yet, but I'm excited to, I'm excited someone's asking that question and I, I want to know the answer. So. 
I don't know if there's anyone from the journalism school on the, in the group there, but there was an effort, I think a year or so ago to create a, a climate reporting, sort of a climate reporting initiative, um, you know, finding effect. And, and this is something I think I'm actually kind of sad and cynical about because there are literally headlines in the New York Times that say, you know, the earth is burning, you know, like the world is on fire. It was like an actual headline, I think, not too long ago. And, and if that's not persuasive, I'm not, I'm not sure what is. And so I think it's, it is super important to think about ways not only to translate data, but to tell stories in such a way that affects, that affects change. Um, and that just doesn't, yeah. you know, that means risk mitigation and, and, and preparedness as well. I, I think, Joan, your statistic about folks with durable medical equipment not being any more particularly prepared than those without is, uh, is actually stunning in some ways. I, I just quickly uh, add, I think uh, there are two things really. I think in terms of the world is burning, I, I, I react to that story uh, with sort of fear, but then sort of paralysis sometimes. And I think the reason that public health or I got into public health with uh, climate change with the lens of public health is because I, I feel like the the way that you can uh, sort of express the impacts of climate change uh, on a sort of person to person level uh, through the health impacts is a very uh, irresistible way of making someone understand how it'll affect their daily lives and and I think that's one of the ways in which I think climate change and, and public health are both pulling in the same way in the efforts to improve both. Uh, and so, but then as a, as a sort of someone climbing the career ladder, I think it's not that, you know, outreach is a pleasure to do. I think just as a systemic thing, I think there needs to be more incentive to recognize it in, in, in sort of the way that I operate day to day. And so, you know, my bread and butter is pub publishing papers and, and I love doing outreach. It's just that, you know, it's getting better, but as long as there is some, some recognition of it on a formal level in careers, such that maybe you spent more time doing outreach than the, that nth paper that you could have done, that would be useful too. Because then I, then I would by all means do it all the time. Really interesting. Um, let's see. I'm not sure I see if there are any other questions that the folks that are watching would like to post, uh, speak now. Um, oh, there's one coming. I, I, that's, that's a terribly tough question, I guess, Ravi, because you, you're, you need to be incentivized to share this information in a way um, that, that is helpful for you in your career, but also helpful for the people that can kind of understand your story. And so that's worth uh, advocating for as much as possible, but it, it's certainly a tough, it's, it's a tough situation. My, my two little kids love going to the pier near Lamont Doherty up in Piermont and going to the Earth Institute Educational Center up there on the weekends and finding fish. And, and uh, it's an enormous impact that they'll remember for a long time. And maybe we need to think about that in some, in some bigger way. Uh, there's a question in the chat about um, Ukraine. It's, it's, this is interesting. Uh, Ukraine is preparing for power outages in the event of war. And there is a for-profit uh, surrogacy, pregnancy surrogacy in industry there. And they are uh, including backup generators to keep embryos frozen moving frozen embryos to neighboring nations with different custody laws and so forth. And uh, Joan, someone would like to hear your opinion on this if you have one, but really uh, this is about, you know, for-profit healthcare and probably more, um, you know, distinct distinction between uh, different, differently resourced populations. Um, I don't know if you have any thoughts about, the for-profit surrogacy industry in the Ukraine. Yeah. On the cuff. Yeah, just let me sure. I can, <laughs> I can sure let me try to tackle this one. Why not? So uh I know nothing about either of those things really, but what I can say is that these are all about compounding disasters. 
and things we're going to see more of with climate change. You know, we've already seen wars fought over climate. We're going to keep seeing that. Um, this question will become applicable, I think, when we have mass climate migration, both within country and across borders. Um, and so it won't be the last time that we see this. And it, it's these types of compounded disasters where we really, really, really see the modifying effect of socioeconomic status, where some people will be com not completely fine, but essentially fine with life relatively unchanged and some people's lives will be devastated. Um, and as we continue to see more inequity in the places that we live, this, this is kind of the situation we're setting ourselves up for. And so I think the more of these types of events that occur, it gives us a second to step back and think about how we wanna set up our societies, what safeguards we need to have in place for low income under-resourced communities uh, if if we want any sort of equitable response to climate disaster and compounded cascading disasters after that. Um, yeah. Uh, I think that that is as about as good as a summary and call to action as we're going to get um, in the in the context of this discussion. So I will leave it there um, with the kind of um, imperative to think about that coming uh, compounding of climate related disasters and frankly, climate related health impacts, uh, whether they're disaster related or not, from both of, you know, from these perspectives that we talked about today, whether it's the built environment or power infrastructure uh, and certainly health outcomes in, in vulnerable populations. I, I appreciate that we're able to come together um, from a really multidisciplinary standpoint, which is the, the only way to approach this. Um, and continue the conversation, you know, frankly, both here at Columbia and in the larger, in the larger community. Um, with that, I want to thank both Joan and Robbie for participating in, you know, a really important ongoing discussion, sharing your work. We certainly look forward to, to seeing what comes next and, and um, continuing this conversation uh, as we move along. Um, with that, I will say thank you to everyone that joined, uh, both in the audience and our panelists. Uh, thanks again to the sponsors of the event for, for putting together such an important conversation um, and have a wonderful afternoon.